Hello, this is Wazo X Wazo coming to you from Delhi. And today, Evil O is very fortunate to be sitting with one of my favorite photographers, Pablo Bartholomew. Welcome, Pablo. How are you? Good. Good? Okay. So today we're going to talk about Pablo's photography and a little things, few things about culture and our cultural experiences. And I think a good place to start is probably, I sort of consider myself an old hippie because I was coming of age in high school in 1967, 68, um, graduated in 1971. And I think that you also relate to those days quite heavily, though you're a little younger than I am. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your interaction with the counterculture? Sure. Sure. Um, I was in high school in the early 70s at that cusp when I was going to be asked to leave uh, high school. so. Uh, it was an interesting moment because we were on a road called Barakamba Road um, and the school walls were very low and it just had barbed wire so you could just see across everything that was going on. Okay. And Barakamba Road uh, starts at Kanot Place which is about a kilometre um, and maybe oh, a kilometer and a half away and about uh, 800 meters down the road is the Mundi House Roundabout and there used to be the Nepal Embassy. So you had this constant flow uh, both ways to the Embassy and back to Connaught Place of Western travelers dressed in all sorts of very colorful, loose garbs. You had Volkswagen vans going down that road, which had obviously come, um, you know, overland from Europe. And you also had, uh, once I saw a London bus, a red bus, which had probably driven with its inhabitants across from the UK uh, <laughs> really? to India. Okay. So, um, you know, it, the outside world seemed very exciting at that time and here we were in boring school. Um, and then in the uh, afternoons once school finished, we would always go into Connaught Place. And there you had uh, groups of uh, long-haired men with their uh, stunningly looking women sit around playing guitar, smoking chillums and everything was very, um, uh, you know, it was just a happening event every day. The zeitgeist of the times was do your own thing. Right. And there was a very strong element of being creative in it, creative in dress, creative in art or music, whatever. So all of this attracted you. Yes. And, but did you find an Indian version of this? Yeah, because there were, um, you know, uh, bands that were playing rock music. We were listening to the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, Jefferson Airplane. Um, all these bands, you know, we would, uh, Jimi Hendrix, we would get uh, kind of LPs which uh, the vinyls would come sort of like in a three month delay, so what was released uh, in the West would only arrive in India um, in that sort of, uh, you know, deferred time. Um, so the Indian part of it was you know, people in colleges were forming bands, were growing their hair, were smoking uh, all Lots over the place. Uh, yes. um, and then you had the backpacker uh, hubs like Pahar Ganj. Like this? 
No, that's too uh, still. It was just the clay, a pipe, the, the chillum. The clay chillums. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all of this sort of had a sort of seminal influence, and I started uh, photographing some of this in the backpacker hotels, in the uh, university campuses, uh, my friends around me that were, uh, many of them were in college and I was still in the sort of last years of my school before they said okay it's time for you to go and I was just so happy. Mm. that I could make my exit. So, during this whole experience of your life, and how old were you at the time, about? Uh, about 16. Okay. Were you already photographing some of this experience? When did you first pick up a camera and decide, okay, this is my journey through life, photography? Mm. Were you at that age already or later? I think, well, I've picked up a camera probably at age four or whatever because my father gifted me a box camera and then there was the dark room available so, and I watched him very carefully though he never instructed me but it was just the whole process of being able to watch and experiment oneself. And, and we should just mention who your father was, Richard Bartholomew. Oh who was a very, very noted art critic and still he wrote in a way that is still one of my favorite, he's still one of my favorite critics today. You know, when I go back and read his reviews, they're mm -hmm. very lucid and they're very to the point, plain writing but thoughtful writing, which I really appreciate. So, you know, I mean, um, let's say that once I left school, there was the big dilemma of what am I going to do with my life? Am I going to go back into another school or am I going to navigate my own way? And that's where photography came as an anchor, where I felt that I had some skills and I should try and use these skills to uh, make a life. Uh, so beyond photographing my family and friends I started photographing theater because my mother was in theater and a lot of the times I was doing sound or lighting uh, for her productions and also photographing. So I'm thinking of some of your images where there's like a couple in bed and they've got I think some LP records or something laying on the bed. Is there, This is from that time period. Yes, right? yes, okay. yes. It's all the 70s going into the 80s. Right. And uh, so there was this softer end of the life there uh, while um, there was the harder edge which was that the hippie movement also here was starting to unravel yes and the junky movement as i would put it started to rise the soft drugs became uh, less exciting for many of the westerners and they wanted to experiment with harder stuff right. so morphine, heroin. That was the downfall of the hippie movement. Uh, started to emerge and one of my early series is on a woman who I photographed over a period of time injecting herself in sort of like a daily life cycle uh, of how she injects, goes back into stupor, getting up, re-injecting so it's a cyclic. That period was so formative for me. And I mean, one thing I found about that period, there was such a emphasis upon individuality. You would agree. It was yes, sort of, of course. Do, you do your own thing, be an individual. In fact, the more of an individual you are, the better. Although you did develop the sort of stereotypical hippie after a while. And I find that very strange when I compare it to our current times. And many people say that the youth movement of today is sort of emulating the hippies, but I don't see it. I mean, I really don't see it because it seems to me like the young people today are more 
um, they're more authoritarian. You know, there's a lot of things that they don't want you to do. They don't have that same liberated spirit. Would you agree to that or no? Do you see that? Or? Yeah, I think part of it is because of um, uh, the connectivity, the social media, many things have marked and changed uh, younger people today. So there are different kinds of controls that they have uh, self regulated in uh, themselves and thereby have become in in a lot of ways narrower um, right. and less uh, tolerant yes because in the hippie movement i mean yes there was an undercurrent of marxism for sure the anti-vietnam war um, uh, the, um, what's the word I'm looking? Power that you know. It was a catalyst. The catalyst, catalyst that propelled the whole hippie movement. Um, but there wasn't, as there is today, um, the sort of shaming culture, the deplatforming culture, all of that. You know, hippies were more like, yeah, yeah, do what you want to do. I mean, those those were the songs. Everybody remembers the John Lennon song, um, Imagine but they don't remember the John Lennon song, whatever gets you through the night, it's all right, it's all right, you know. That was the flip side of mm. that, that era. Um, well, I think, you know, when you look at the 70s, uh, you're coming out of post-World World War II, many nations are reorganized, are formed. There is a naive innocence of nationhood. Um, so things are being explored. Now things have been formed and are not being explored. There's the reverse where there is a kind of imposition of a certain kind of, whether they call it morality, political correctness, all these things and that has had its own effect. In, in, in fact, the kind of work that I did at that time as a very innocent, naive expression of photographing all of this, today is emulated once again by younger photographers, but it lacks that innocence because or and exploration because the cell phone has made everybody so conscious of what the image can do. Everybody has a cell phone, everybody is an image maker. So the whole relationship to the making and taking of an image has completely warped. So it's, in your opinion, it's much more difficult to make a candid today because of the influence of the cell phone? Well, you can make a candid or you can make a near candid, but it's much more contrived because both the viewer and the viewed are in some kind of waltz uh, knowing where the end product is going to go and the end product ends up in some sort of social media platform. I, I think that's one reason, I mean this is my own feeling, but one reason that studio photography has made such a big comeback because it's like in the studio it's like you know you're playing this game you know, you know you're not making a candidate. Everybody is a participant mm. in, in what's happening. But I want to get back to more of your photography work um, and also to India. So you did a very um, wonderful uh, series and a few like iconic shots up at the Babri Masjid and the demolition. Do you want to talk about that at all? Your experience in making those photographs? Uh, well, that comes out of, you know, um, again, uh, uh, you know, at one point I had to really figure out where I wanted to go with some of my photography because all of this um, documentation of friends and family and the people around me and the milieu that I was photographing was all very well, but I wasn't making any money out of it. And so I left Delhi and went to Bombay. I worked in the movie industry for several years. As a stills photographer, I worked in advertising. 
but my real sort of um, uh, kind of mark that I wanted to reach was in the international media. So I went and found a photo agency in New York, which partnered with a very big photo agency in France. And with that, the new cycle in my life started and I started to photograph current events. And one of my earliest uh, uh, were assignments was for time and I went to Assam to photograph the Nelly massacre, mm. which now has resonance again with all this um, citizens uh, bills yes. and what have you. And um, it, it's all to do with the outsider coming into a certain area and then the backlash and it was a horrible... It's a very uh, complex situation in the Northeast. So uh, starting with that then with the Sikh movement in the early 80s which started just as uh, a cry for more water and electricity and it didn't um, it fell it fell on deaf ears of the government and then the agitation took a political move and then um, you know for a separate state so um, with that going into the um, late 80s with Mrs. Gandhi's death Rajiv Gandhi coming to power documenting all of that the caste uh, issues uh, with Mandal and then came Babri Masjid so it was you like you Union Carbide I think yeah well Bhopal was the big uh, but that wasn't politics that was uh, as uh, Union Carbide alleges espionage by workers but it actually is just uh, is that what they actually allege it was yeah espionage it's, by it's, workers yeah yeah uh, well, that they sorry not espionage sabotage by were workers okay. who introduce water into uh, one of the tanks and thereby uh, creating this whole thing. But actually, it's just bad management. Right. Um, and uh, I've always assumed it was bad management. Right. And improper training, possibly. Right. right. And safety standards being very low, right. being at that time we were a third world right. developing country. Um, so, yeah, so Ayodhya started uh, as another assignment and one didn't really know where it was going until um, uh, L.K. Advani brought this big um, chariot uh, yatra or journey across India which then started fueling communal violence and uh, it just kept on spiraling and spiraling into a time when um, it was planned to bring the mo mosque down. So that's the way I look at it. And here we are now with the Supreme Court giving its judgment that the temple needs to be built, which... It's amazing how all this has unfolded over right. the years. So, right. I mean, you know, mm, that assignment or a series of assignments or following that thread of that story brought me to the destruction, uh, being an eyewitness to the destruction of the Babri Masjid and just about, I think, nearly... What were you, I mean, this is kind of personal, but as you were photographing it, what, were you, what was going through your head at the time? Were you sort of like, oh my God, they're really doing this? Or did you totally expect it as a photographer that they were going to tear down? No, I think Masjid. there were many things happening because we were being attacked. Mm. Uh, so that uh, the ho the, all the media was being attacked at that point so that there would be no documentation of it. So there was this whole thing to survive, yet be able to photograph and I was able to uh, hide some film that I had shot uh, because my cameras got taken away and broken. Uh, oh, they I, broke your camera. Right. Okay. And I was nearly killed. Uh, 
Were you? Yeah. So it was that defining moment. How did they try to kill you? Well, I mean, they, because they were chasing all the media people. Okay. And at one point, they tripped me and I fell. And there were a group of these guys that surrounded me. And uh, one of them had these two bricks, which were called the Shilanyas. Okay. And he brought it up and he was going to bring it down on my yeah. head. And um, it's just good fortune that uh, he changed his mind and said, run. And I ran and then the crowd chased me uh, further. Uh, and uh, in that period, another photographer um, who also had been chased was able to find um, a senior policewoman uh, who then uh, rescued him and then he pointed that I needed to be rescued so she came to get m me because you could see they were at an elevation and you could see what was happening and they quelled the crowd by saying that they are arresting us and they will take us to the police lockup so now that they are under them, the crowd doesn't need to worry. They will be dealt with severely and the crowd kind of dispersed. And they put us into a little hut um, with guards around. So we were uh, pretty close to the demolition site and could hear everything but not see, right. apart from the initial, yeah, you, uh, you know, the when the crowds when got onto the, the minarets the and all domes. So I just want to um, probe into your Burma history a little bit, because I know you were going through archives in your home in well, Burma, yes? Well, that's, that's another story that, you know, how life takes turns or strange turns or unforeseen turns. My father never spoke about his origins. I, we all knew he was Burmese. He cooked Burmese food, but he never, I mean, I know as a child, I have some stories that he told us about his uh, walk, his march from Burma into India. But as we were growing up, he really never spoke about it and I guess when you're growing up in this very messed up uh, 70s where everything is in flux you really are more interested in the moment and not about your origins so it's not until after his death that some questions really started coming up in my head and that was in the 30s, but it was too late uh, to really ask him. And then in 2011 uh, or 2011, I got an email uh, from a woman that said that she was my father's cousin. Okay and that she lived in Thailand and they waited for him to return to Burma but he never came back now that they've seen his website so I guess they tracked me from the website that I had built on him and that uh, uh, you know um, that they would like to meet me I felt for some time that this may be a hoax because it was coming from Western Thailand, uh, close to the Burmese border. Um, and, but my family was supposed to be in Burma, which, who I, which I had no idea of. Uh, in 2013, I had gone to Sydney for a photo festival and an exhibition and on the way back I stopped in Bangkok and went um, to visit the aunt and his son 
to find that uh, the aunt had moved back to Burma, uh, but the son was there, and we met, and um, you know we decided that we would make a joint trip uh, to Burma, and so in the subsequent year, uh, both of us uh, met in Rangoon or Yangon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got a car and we drove around meeting many of our relatives. Principally, many of them were in uh, Yangon, but to Mandalay, up uh, further to Maimyo, which is in the hills, and then further down south to where my father was born, uh, Davoy, which used to be known as Tavoy. Uh, and, and as you were doing this traveling, were you collecting a photo archive then too? Well, I photographed many of them. Okay. I also videoed some of them and interviewed them. I took with me uh, a friend uh, who could use the camera and uh, the video camera and had her kind of follow me around so there were things like we went back to his old school okay. St. Paul which is one of the big schools in uh, Yangon um, we went uh, to see uh, all the uncles and the aunts that uh, were alive um, since then the aunt that contacted me had died and uh, I happened to be in Burma at that time, so I went for her funeral. Um, many of my cousins have gotten married, I went for a marriage. So there's been this sort of back and forth. I still need to figure out what I'm going to do with all the material. Uh, yeah. It's something which again has been put on the back burner because there are other projects that you know keep coming up. And, uh, I sort of, which are closer, uh, easier and smaller to close. This seems kind of epic and I need to sort of find a way to really uh, do it. Decide how you're going to present it. Right. Right. Okay, so this is getting a little long. We'll probably cut it short soon. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about briefly? Mm, no. No? That's it? Uh, it's up to you. I mean. <laughs> I mean, I can go on and on and on. So. I know. Pablo, you're an amazing person. Mm -hmm. And even just listening to you now today, it's like I remember again how amazing Pablo Bartholomew really is. That's what I want to ask you. Bartholomew. That doesn't sound like a Burmese name. Where does that name come from? Well, as I found out, the family sent me a, uh, a tree, a family okay. tree for once, uh, you know, all this email. Happened. So there seems to be some English blood okay. from my great grandfather, and this is all from my grandmother's side. So it's the maternal Burmese family, and how many of them then subsequent generations married Irish and Scottish. But the Bartholomew name comes from my father's side, and there's nothing that I've been able to find out about, about uh, the ancestry except for his father retired as a um, as the chief railway engineer so I'm trying to see if I can play with the two sides and the histories and then bring in my father's whole thing with the Second World War and uh, the family so we'll see we have to cut it. Right. Pablo Bartholomew. Oh. Want a drag? Old hippie? <laughs> Do you want one? Do you want a drag? There's nothing no? out there. <laughs> Can I jump you in? <laughs> okay, we end this. Pablo, it was wonderful speaking to you. Yeah. This is Wazwo X Wazwo Evil O talking to you from New Delhi with Pablo Bartholomew. Please remember to like and subscribe as always and bye. So wave goodbye. Bye.